We're going to get started to discuss the show that we have cur currently in the gallery. Uh, to be fair, we were not planning on doing this, um, but because a series of circumstances that changed the date and so on, it, it made it uh, impossible for me to be here when the opening was. So we thought it was a good idea um, to have the chance to chat a little bit about it because I think the, 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 the exhibition that David and Carol put there also have very particular characteristics which are, I would argue, fairly different than with many of the shows that we've done in the past in the school. Um, to give a, lar a larger context, this is a, it has been a long, a long going program already since 2001. There have been many, many, many installations and exhibitions is roughly around four, four, four to six a year, depends on each year. And it started originally, it was supposed to be always an installation. Uh, maybe it, I, I'm gonna start with the, the, that very basic question, um, just to keep it simple, to get going, which is, why you guys decided to do something that's more, is, is really more an exhibition than an installation? Or maybe not, maybe somewhere in between. It's not really an installation, it's not really, an exhibition because it's not really a curated selection of works, you know, or, or pieces, pieces that were created new for this. But nevertheless, let, let's start with the basics. Why you guys approach it to do that, to go that way and not do like a, yeah. what is more known in the architecture world as an architecture installation? Yeah. Well, before like jumping in though, like uh... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. First question is, who do you want to thank? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. We have a series of yeah. sponsors, so we and have to. We, we have to thank, like a show like this, it doesn't happen just because you want to do it. Like, people have to be generous about it. So, uh, uh, first, uh, you know, Daniel Horowitz, uh, uh, he, he really, I couldn't have done this, uh, like, Carol and I we couldn't have done this without Daniel really leading this, you know. So, thanks, Daniel, for making this happen. Uh, then we, of course, have our students, you know, who help, and some are former students that aren't here anymore, uh, including Stefano Passeri did a couple of the images from already two years ago. Sinas Budin was a student from Pratt. Uh, then from here we have uh, uh, Ryan Skavnicki who did uh, the projected images. Uh, we have uh, Rishab Jain and Raven Crabtree that helped us out with all kinds of logistical stuff. Javier Benavides and Stefan Bika helped us hang the show. So, you know, thanks all of you. Uh, you know, we can't get something like this done without all of your help. Uh, but most importantly, uh, uh, Mark Fisher from Solid Terrain Modeling is here. Uh, he's right there in the blue shirt. And uh, he, his shop fabricated the four models. And uh, he did an uh, enormous amount of work uh, for really virtually nothing for us. And it was kind of a remarkable act of generosity. It will not happen again. Yeah. Yeah. But I just really wanted to thank you because this really couldn't have been done un unless you were generous about it. And so thank you for that. All right. So uh, uh, with that, I, I give it to you, Carol. Yeah. To yeah. answer your question yeah. about exhibition you take the hard versus one. installation. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right that it lives somewhere in between exhibition and installation. It's, uh, it's installation in so far as that it, is, um, it embodies a, an idea and an interest, although it lives as a kind of evolution of that idea and interest in that some of the earliest pieces were developed uh, with different techniques and different um, kind of technologies. And as we developed the ideas, the techniques and technologies and the media medium changed. changed. Um, so at some point, it does kind of live as an installation because it does manifest a, a kind of um, roughly singular idea that we have. Yeah. I think uh, installation, uh, if I remember right, uh, Eric wanted to like have some kind of uh, use as a learning tool, right? So like, let's build a small chunk of building or do something kind of proto-architectural and build it. But uh, uh, I, I don't think our, our, our heads are in that kind of space in recent years. So like uh, we just had a series of preoccupations 
which uh, resulted in, and like we would have done a lot of this work uh, regardless whether or not there was a show or not. So it was kind of work that was there kind of evolving. And then, all right, let's do a show. So like uh, there was really no way to somehow make it site specific or somehow turn it into something where we're, all right, then pretend to some kind of uh, building research, which it's not, you know. So it's stuff that uh, maybe uh, is not even so architectural in an obvious way, but it's just some, somehow underlying our interests over the past two to three years. And uh, so it, it just makes more sense to hang it in a more discreet way as a series of artifacts that uh, there's probably uh, four distinct different techniques and interests. Not that that really matters. You know how much uh, I, I don't like talking about the techniques, you know, behind the book. But uh, it, it seemed it was more of a, a opportunity to curate like three years worth of work and three years worth of interests in a way that held together just as uh, within the space of a gallery. You know, so yeah. So I think that's pretty much uh, how I understand. Well, there may be three to four eras mm -hmm. in, the, in the work, although there is probably not so clear where the edges lie between those eras. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true that um, the interest is singular, right? I, th I don't think the interest, the interest has evolved, but it, it remains a kind of core interest. But it, it is the kind of, um, the best way to kind of manifest the interest or new ways to, man or to research the interests that's where the that's where the kind of boundaries of the different eras lie. Go, going more into the the way I read some of the pieces, and uh, it's kind of interesting in the sense of um, one of the things I find more the most compelling part of of of, of the, the stuff there, particularly the, the four main pieces in in the, the model ones, is. Uh, usually architecture struggles to keep uh, up in terms of the culture or social or the psychic moment. It always seems like, um, and I think that that's, that's one of the reasons why I think modernism is still so powerful and the, and the shadow, the cast is so long because it's probably one of the few times in history that architecture was really ahead of the curve or in parallel with everything else that was happening. And, and after that, it, it always has been much more difficult to struggle, but there is something about the notion of, uh, of fake and reality that seems to be very proper in terms of the con current contemporary culture. And I really don't want to get into the politic in politics or all that. I'm not talking about that, but, but I think it goes beyond that. I mean, uh, of course, the, the current political climate is a direct consequence of that, but I'm going beyond that. I'm going the way that we filter and we understand our relation with the world and with our environment, which is not clear or not even relevant, what is tangible or what is not. And I, I never like the distinction between virtual and real, because I think the virtual is as real as the real. But there is a certain notion that you can start to construct new realities and start to live on their own. And then even to the point they create a confusion that nobody, nobody knows exactly what it is. So in a way, um, my, my, my question, if there is a question in this, is the sense that as much as this seems like a pieces, it kind of start to see like a, what I would call like miniature scenarios of design. In the idea that you can create this intersection between two, dif two multiple reals or, or fake being just another dimension of reality. If that's so, how do you think that this can evolve in something that it becomes more tangible in terms of the convention, or maybe it doesn't aspire to have any of that? You want me to say? <laughs> okay, so uh, when you talk about um, real versus fiction, I feel like that's, I mean, you positioned it as a kind of um, cultural narrative. Uh, I think that's the scale of um, thinking about the work that this guy uh, handles. Um, I, I think I think about it slightly differently at a much smaller scale or a much more personal scale. <clears throat> so I tend to be interested in it in terms of a kind of um, in terms of how it 
is uh, defamiliarizing in terms of um, ideas of uh, the uncanny and even in terms of the history of that term. So part of my, part of my interest is maybe to imagine at what scale you can engage uh, a kind of moment of defamiliarization. You know, is it at the, the scale of uh, um, a kind of larger landscape uh, versus the scale of a, um, something that your, your body kind of engages more one-to-one? Uh, -one. Uh, so th these, are the, these are touching the, what's interesting to me rather than kind of larger questions of fiction and reality. So, uh, so I, I, in a way, I'm not answering the question at all and passing it back, but um, yeah. Well, I've been joking with uh, friends at this uh, exhibition. It's like a fake news geology. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and so uh, there definitely is a, uh, an interest uh, I have in how our tools of description uh, is uh, really essentially the same tools for uh, our tools for fiction making. That uh, fiction and description of the real, they, I mean, what could be more different from each other, but they, both regimes use the same tools, which I found interesting. So I wanted to use, get to know those tools extremely well uh, and you have to dig really deep to see why they're the same tools. You know? And because it's not obvious when you just open up, say, ArcGIS versus opening up Mudbox, it looks totally different. But you dig into it, it's the same. It's the same tool, essentially. So uh, I was interested in pushing for the convergence of these two things that are kept apart, or maybe economic or maybe even political or institutional reasons that they're understood to be different kind of kingdoms, like the kingdom of fiction making versus the kingdom of describing a terrain through data, right? But they're actually the same stuff, you know? So, uh, so I think uh, there the distinction of fact and fiction, you see that it, they dissolve into an bi even bigger problem of uh, the role that technology plays in erasing that difference. You know? So uh, it's, it's true, I think, uh, Carol and I, we have very different interests that are intersecting in this kind of work. You know? so, but uh, they're not wholly different either, it's just that uh, I tend to look more at the, the horizon, whereas Carol might be looking in what's in the palm of your hand. Right? Um, the other thing which I think in some of the images that you show, I, I, don't, I don't think you're showing one of them, specifically the one I'm thinking, but um, to keep a little bit with this notion of um, the contemporary culture that we live in, um, in, the, in the last 25, 30 years for any, any, anybody who's been working or visiting China or in the cities in China, it's almost like impossible that any kind of urban or project development happens until there is a miniature of the whole city <laughs> and the whole scheme, how it's going to be. So in a way, each, of course, when you go to the, and each of them, they build a hall, that they hold these big models, and it's usually like the, the one in the Queen's Museum in New York and so on. But, but in China, it became this kind of an instrument of tourism, but also an instrument of politics and how it's going to operate. And of course, if you go to Shanghai and Beijing, it, it, seems, it seems less uh, strange because already they are more than halfway there. But you go to these places in the middle of nowhere and there is things and they're going to tell you in the next 10 years, something like this will be here. So there is something about this notion of miniature as, a, as an aspirational thing. So in a way, you start to operate um, what I'm trying to say is, in a way, your project is in producing all these things in innovation, but at the same time, it's very rooted in certain traditions of our field that use the notion of miniature or miniaturization or creating new fiction as a platform in which eventually the reality, the real reality, will happen. The question I have for you, to me, is much more the relation, which I see that, for example, in the models, but the images are something else. 
What I, want, what I want to say, what I think is different about what you guys have been doing, which I will call, they are somehow process of miniaturization. They are pixel construction of images, which is slightly different than the traditional miniature, miniature that came from the physical models. So how much we think there is a potential in this to go beyond itself, or maybe they don't. And if that a limitation or is that a virtue of, of, of this body of work? That's a fascinating question. Can I get a fascinating answer? Processing. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I slipped these photos in the beginning, uh, one of a bunch of uh, European academics huddled around the model of the Alps at the Alpine Museum. I also included uh, a still of, from The Shining of Jack Nicholson yeah. staring at the uh, hedge maze, and Richard Dreyfuss uh, yeah. obsessively making Devil's Tower in his living room, right? Yeah. Now, uh, I, I was fascinated by that from the very beginning here, you know, and, uh, and uh, I, I find that really interesting about uh, architecture, that uh, we both love models, and uh, architects uh, uh, are obsessed with that kind of miniaturization, right? Uh, but then again, who doesn't, you know? Uh, you go to the Grand Canyon Visitor Center, and you remember how I was fascinated by that model of the Grand Canyon in the visitor center with the little red arrow, you are here, you know? There's something so weird about that, I thought, you know? Like uh, this desire to somehow shrink down the world to an object that can be stared at as though you're not in the world anymore, you know? So uh, I, I don't know, like uh, there's something enigmatic about that human desire to have a model in front of you that's kind of the world shrunken down. So one, I wanted to uh, just uh, dwell in that for a little, little bit and not uh, <laughs> just stick to what's already there that you're shrinking down, but what's really not there yet that you're shrinking down. And uh, just think about uh, what, how can you deploy GIS to do that kind of shrinking down of the world, but a world that doesn't even exist, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, you're right, the images start doing something else, like. Uh, uh, it's uh, Carol's brother-in-law, uh, Bill Klein. My brother. Uh, uh, my brother-in-law, your brother. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Carol was working fake more news. on the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all kinds of fake news. Uh, working more with the AI, AI and maybe you could talk about what was going on with the AI, which is kind of a different thing, you know? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a much different thing. I mean... Um, my brother is a AI PhD, and he's an AI engineer. He's um, working with his, in his own work with uh, neural networks, um, which are interesting because they they learn how to write their own software. So the in, uh, the inputs that the um, neural network gets kind of um, uh, is a kind of recursive uh, self learning or teaching or writing, um, and so the control that you might have would be to um, kind of assign value or assign success or failure to some degree to those inputs. And then little by little you can kind of rely on uh, these neural networks to learn how to write the, the software so it can in extremely complex ways kind of produce outputs that it knows will kind of fit the, the kind of standards that you're, um, that you're describing to it through kind of a the, the inputs that you're offering. Yeah. Anyway, um, so there's this kind of sophisticated uh, way of inputting information, inputting uh, images that have uh, kind of uh, high, high degrees of resolution, high degrees of detail, and uh, letting the software, and uh, with your help really, but um, letting it produce extremely um, well-articulated, high-resolution uh, kind of hybrids of, the, of this material. And um, it's, what's so compelling about it, for me, is the kind of resolution that you get, um, because it becomes a moment where you can really kind of zoom into something and um, 
understand a kind of material condition at a, a much different scale and then zoom back out again and begin to occupy it and begin to design with it and begin to think about how meaning might live with it. Um, so to some degree, the relationship of miniaturization there, I suppose, or scale, I suppose, or um, resolution is a, is a little bit different um, than with the models and perhaps than with the images that are slightly more pictorial, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I think the relationship to how, uh, how we're engaging it or how we're hoping to or, or what's interesting or compelling about it to us is slightly different between the two. Mm -hmm. I do think there is a, a, a kind of nostalgic um, effect that, that the kind of models have. That mm -hmm. this, there's a kind of nostalgia of other kinds of topographical, geographical models that you have memories of from elementary school even. And so it's kind of, a, it's a kind of a strange uh, moment when you engage something that seems simultaneously familiar, but you, but you can't place this it either. This is something right? I think we were trying to make clear by the way we laid out the space that uh, in the uh, front part uh, before the wall, that's all, all the images, uh, and th that's the most recent work that's uh, produced through messing with the AI model. The main space is more, uh, I think, more traditional kind of uh, subjective uh, defamiliarization, um, defamiliarizing of images we've seen, but it's still us, like uh, choosing and composing, blending. It's very human and subjective in that sense, even though like we use a lot of weird tools to do it. In, in the front part of the gallery, that's mechanized defamiliarization. And it produced images that really surprised us. Like uh, we definitely selected the ones we liked the best, so there's still selection going on. There's still taste in just the fact that we're trying to push it in a direction, but nonetheless, uh, the machine is doing something very strange that we don't totally understand. It. But you do develop a relationship with the machine. You learn, you learn kind of what it's doing, and so you can start to kind of feed it feed it uh, images, n knowing to some degree or expecting a, expecting relationship, expecting kind of structures to kind of emerge from it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you, so you, there's a kind of symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. between this kind of mechanized production. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I want to stay on this mini the miniature part for one, one, one more round for, because there's something which I, I, I think the, 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 the exhibition is fantastic and also has a kind of a psychedelic quality too, but that, that's not here or there. It's more, it's more like an artistic sensibility. But what I find interesting about the notion of miniature, and, and I think in terms of the possibility of new coherences emanating out of this, is in a way, yeah, the, the model and the miniature has been part of the repertoire architecture for many, 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 many decades and centuries and so on. And I think it came out of necessity of, of pragmatics to try to figure out how, we'll think, how things will be. But at the same time, there was what I would call a byproduct, which it, it kept reinforcing this idea of godlike quality of the authorship mm -hmm. overpowering the miniature and the size and so on. But in a way, one of these, many of the technologies that you guys are, are, are embracing in, 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 in the development of these things, theoretically supposed to argue for at uh, one point was for the disappearance of authorship, but I would argue that is, 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 what, what we really are in presence is the presence of a new reformulation of authorship. And in that sense, I think this is a different, pro again, it's not, it's not really accurate on my part to call it miniaturization, because it's truly about millions of pixels, which is slightly different, because actually you're not miniaturizing them, you're just making them smaller, but it's not the same than miniature. So these are not the scale, scalar effects. These things are, when you do pixel, pixel uh, the, the image, if you make it 20 times bigger, the resolution will be the same. It will be just bigger. But there is something about this, pro this, this issue about authorship and the mm -hmm. idea of the relation between that and the scale of things and how that will relate to it. And that's why I think it's interesting about this kind of a mutation of this notion of miniaturization, even though it's not, but just for the sake of it. 
to keep it in that world. And, and I wonder how, how satisfied or disappointed you are in terms of the level actually it comes across like a high level of authorship despite its best effort to try mm -hmm. not to be that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I, I think uh, uh, we have no interest in being uh, non-authors. I mean, that's for sure. That's something we both absolutely agree about is, yeah, we're, we're obsessed with uh, being authors, like first and foremost. And, but at the same time, like, uh, we, we don't want to be kind of nostalgic, like, uh, about authorship. Like, uh, More about authenticity, yeah. like, yeah. that you had to somehow place each of those colored pixels there yourself in order to claim authorship. There's no nostalgia in terms of a kind of work ethic or a kind of authenticity. I mean, uh, the show is, uh, I mean, a subtext of it is there's nothing in the show that is uh, invented from nothing. Everything is culled from databases and found images and tools that are at hand and so it's a giant project of appropriation for sure and uh, I, I think uh, I would insist that uh, uh, that's where uh, uh, we have to consider maybe new models of authorship that uh, it shouldn't be such a black and white choice in my opinion of uh, if you're an author you do it from scratch like cooking from scratch I make my own pasta by rolling the dough and all versus uh, like buying the ready-made stuff and cooking it, right? Uh, for me, that's not the issue. I think for me, the issue is how it's received by the beholder. And I think uh, relative to that, I think uh, the, the problem of authorship becomes much more complex and has to include all kinds of things that would traditionally be excluded from what's legit as what an author would use as ingredients. Uh, I, I know uh, I, I'm going to let, let you continue because uh, we, we have different attitudes about this, I think. I, we're not in total agreement about this, but about what it means to be an author and how personal it should be or impersonal it should be. Well, I agree that I would say both of us are not rejecting author, authorship, ideas of authorship. I think I understand how it might appear that that's an agenda, but uh, it's certainly not. Um, however, when you talk about a kind of relationship of um, a kind of uh, feeling of being godlike to your miniature world that you've created, I think to some degree there may be, there may, there's something about that that might be part of this authorship discussion too, in that there's kind of larger sweeps of the hand that but you, you know, but it's still. I mean, I, I, they're, it, they're there because. They're there because you, you. Uh, I don't know. Of all the things that were kind of produced, they're the ones that you chose. They're the ones that are, without being meaningful, mean something to you, right? But, um, <laughs> So I, yeah, I, well, I think um, uh, one of the things we were talking about a lot during the making of this was uh, uh, just this question, why are we picking the images that we're picking? You know? And uh, it's not all technical, like uh, we're not just picking it just to get the best result you know, only, like we're also picking it because we're, uh, we have some affinity for it or we see things in it, uh, it makes us feel good to look at it and use it and so on. So there's, there is always something very personal and a little bit hard to describe, which is why we end up talking so little during it. We just make it, look at it, what else could be different, and keep making. And so this is like the, probably the first time really during this whole process uh, in the lead up to this discussion where we actually discuss some of these topics, which might, I thought might surprise people to know like uh, we, how little we talk about the bigger issues. It's just interest and technicality and tasting it while you're cooking. But like you say, yeah. apophenia, like it's without, without meaning. So in a sense, it's, it is just, but to some degree, that's always what design is. You're kind of responding to things and you kind of have, you kind of intuit what's right and wrong and you aren't always driven by a, an, uh, an obvious logic or a, a kind of truth. 
I, I want to pick up on this of, of without meaning, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that I, it came up in the conversation with Peter um, when we talk about his book, and which I think is, is really like a recurring theme, which I think when there is an investment of technology with the desire to make it disappear as well, which is there is an interesting, for me, correlation or a possible interesting correlation between uh, what I consider productive useless, uselessness. Like I think your exhibition is basically is useless stuff in the best sense of the word. Not that's a criticism, but something that's positive. But I think it's different that, um, that without meaning. And I think sometimes we tend to combine or use those things as interchangeable. And it, this is something that architecture struggles for the longest time. And I would argue that some of the qualities that make architecture, makes architecture relevant through history and time actually are useless in the sense of productivity. But that doesn't make them that mean, meaningless. So I, I find that there is a little bit of what I would say positive contradiction in the title of the show. I would argue that it's useless, but I would not. Argue, but I would argue that it's not without meaning. I think that uh, the without meaning is that it wasn't produced with meaning in I mind. Know, like I it didn't come from, right? So there's nothing. It, it, that wasn't kind of where it began. I, I think what's. I think the reason why images are chosen or they become provocative or compelling is because that's the moment where they can become meaningful. But. Uh, you know, so you can begin to articulate meaning, or you can begin to imagine how you might be able to pu well, I think push that, meaning on. Well, I, this is something that preoccupied us already, like ten years ago, where like we saw tendencies in contemporary architecture to make really cheesy narratives, right? and that we definitely agree about. Like, uh, oh, it's it's a bird, you know, and oh, now we get it, and we both want to vomit, you know, when we see that kind of strategy deployed, you know. And so, but then it led to another kind of question. I remember when we uh, did that collaboration with Paul Miota, and he so liberally was uh, applying possible narratives, right, in the project. And we we're both like a little bit grossed out by it, right? Like, a, so, like, a, but what's wrong with you guys? Aren't the, isn't this just the obvious narratives that uh, people would uh, think about when they look at this work? Right? And so uh, that led to just this question I started considering, like, uh, well, how do you actually construct meaning in the contemporary world when all forms of power are more or less uh, something we feel alienated from? Like, which narrative, uh, which narrative of which power do we want to deploy and so on? So it, it seemed like almost impossible to have a meaning that's right for every group, right? So like, therefore, like, who's the architect to somehow have special access to the right meaning, right? So like, uh, it, all right, how about this? Why don't we produce things with sufficient material complexity and expertise and, and intricacy and resolution and uh, we kind of leave the meaning to the beholder? Like there's enough there so that there can be meaning, but it's not any meaning we supply. We just supply the kind of substrate for the projection of meaning. And, and hence, that's the title. It's like, you know, the Rorschach test, that's why we started looking at that. You know, like, it's not a blank, a Rorschach page, inkblot is not a, it, first of all, it means nothing. And, but it's also not a blank page either. There's sufficient complexity and detail and resolution, crispness, edge, figure, so enough there that people can read into it with meaning. You know, so, so I think uh, this is in some ways uh, very much a continuation of this preoccupation with how do you construct meaning in the contemporary world. And, yeah. yeah, so meaningless, uh, useless, uh, maybe they're, they're I think actually part of the same problem, I think. Because uh, when something's useful, we know what it means. It's for this. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one before, I think, we open question for the audience, and this is like a really super basic, straightforward. Uh, I'm curious why the images in the front don't have a frame, and the ones in the back, they do. Ran out of money. 
it's, it's, it's as simple as that. No, because no, other. no, because I thought I thought there was something maybe deeper than that in the sense of like the one it's, it's John Ford. Uh, that's why that's why he didn't he didn't think sire by the way in the list of people think like we are the the main investors and we don't get a thing. Thank you, sire. Um, but uh, no, because I thought that maybe there was a correlation between things. That Thank you, John. Yeah. I think there could be, though. Yeah. But that, that's maybe a moment where you can kind of find meaning, too. But no, to me, but, it was no, not but so really. much about the meaning. It was much more about the, the intentionality of it. Like the one in the back, they were more like this kind of surreal exercise that belonged to different. But they were also time. pictorial. And they were trying to be, yeah, pictorial, nostalgic, were, trying to be on the thing. And the one in the front seems this is just information, it's there for you. So I, I just wanted to put that one there yeah. to see there was something no, more than right. lack of budget, which I think, don't get me wrong, lack of budget, it triggers. Creativity. I, I, another day, <laughs> I, no, another day I'll explain it again. Like uh, the, whole post the whole post apocalyptic aesthetic of science fiction, the Blade Runner in 1982, right. it came out of lack of budget for Bill Scott. And people forget that. So he probably wouldn't done that, and since then we have that as the only view of the future. So lack of budget it has been very powerful in terms of what it does. But anyway, I, I just, uh, we have another 15 minutes, so I want to make sure that if people want to ask a question, we have time for it. So. Well, you know, by the way, related to that, I mean, I was being a jerk for saying it's because we ran on. I mean, it, it was, Somewhat intentional, of course. But uh, uh, just one thing to add. It was intentional uh, to well, don't well, spend money on that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, well, you know, I, uh, when I was walking through it with uh, Jeff Kipnis, uh, he said something really interesting. He said uh, the images in the front, uh, he, uh, it wasn't that he didn't like it, but he didn't know what to do with it because he said, uh, and I thought this was a really interesting way to put it, that pictures were not telling me how to look at it. Whereas the other stuff he was a little more comfortable with because it was more clear like how he was being instructed to look at it. And I, I think that was a kind of an interesting observation like uh, as a kind of quality of the machine generated image of imagery. It's, there's somehow a kind of weird uh, or unfamiliar strategy of composition that uh, we, we also found very peculiar. So, yeah. Yeah. Again, any questions? Me? The gentleman with the computer. I'm, I'm snorting. <laughs> <laughs> Taking notes. <laughs> no, I'm just holding on to it. Um, well, I, I think my question um, builds up a little bit on some of the discussions, uh, the discussion of the, the fake and the real a little bit, <clears throat> which of course is, is you know, a rather cultural um, debate right now. But also, Carol was mentioning uh, the notion of authenticity, and that made me think, and I know David, you and I have been talking about this, um, uh, thinking back to Walter Benjamin and his notion of like authenticity. You know, what, what is authenticity and his, his notion that it has something to do with aura and that aura is not given to every object. It's only given to certain kinds of objects. And it relates to authenticity and that relates to the here and now as he puts it. And if that here and now goes away because you replicate things and make copies in his particular case, you lose the aura and you lose the authenticity. And um, of course, in his point of view, that, that's a bad thing. Um, fast forward, if I look at these images and the models, I find them incredibly erratic, first of all. I think there's an amazing aura that is emanating from them. And it makes me think because it's, it's interesting because to me, there's certainly, if not a lack of the here and now, clearly a lack of the here, right? Because if the here can also be understood as in technological terms, in terms of categories of, let's say, what was nature and what was technology, that kind of here has disappeared, right? Because the technology has become so immersive with, quote unquote, nature. And I was just wondering, um, the do you see that there is some kind of, um, do we need to completely rethink principles of authenticity? Have they just gone away? Um, can we say we're in a post 
post-Benjamin world in which um, notions of aura no longer depend on things like the original or the copy? I can, um, we've been reading, rereading that very famous article together. Uh, I think last time we were driving around in Germany reading it, right? And yeah, yeah. I mean, this is our idea of fun, or, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird, actually. But uh, so uh, the argument, right, is let's say with like a religious uh, icon. Uh, it's there in that place, it's specific to space and time. It's there for a mass, for a Catholic mass, and as a ritual, that's what gives it its uh, authenticity or its realness. But now we're in the 20th century with photography, and there's a picture of that icon on somebody's uh, wall in a dorm room somewhere. Right? It uh, costs $5.99, you know. There's no Catholic mass happening in that dorm room, right? The aura is withering because it's being reproduced and copied and so on. So, so my interest in rereading this and rereading it with you is that uh, what else is it, uh, this thing we call Google image search, but the most ridiculous intensification of that kind of multiplication? where there's absolutely zero aura now. Everything is just wiped out. There's no glow, no authentic, and, and maybe everything is, almost everything is there. So like, uh, uh, I often joke about this with my students when a reference comes up in our desk crit. Do you know this building? You know, we used to have to go down to Avery Library and take like a two, three days and with a bag of quarters to Xerox and redraw it and so on. You know, that was, it was highly ritualistic. And now what do we do? We just Google it right there on the, on the desk and like 100 images come up and what's the difference, right? So I think this is uh, like uh, the need to theorize appropriation because everything has, I think, essentially become a digital junkyard. Nothing has aura, so I think this work for me, uh, and I'll, I'll shut up in a second, is uh, I think it's a real concerted attempt, like a lot of our recent work, to re-enchant it. It's everything is becoming disenchanted. We as authors want to re-enchant it. And I don't know if it's really possible, but that's the gamble to reconstruct aura, right? But for what, I think maybe that's a different kind of question, but we, I think we want to see if we can do that first. Uh, thank you for talking about this and opening up to us. I, uh, I want to know what's next with this project and where it goes from here. And I also want to know why in one of the images with a really big sight model, there's someone hang gliding in the top left corner. Uh, called the BC Experience. It was uh, 40 feet wide, 100 feet long, I'm sorry, 74 feet long, and it was a model of British Columbia. But the visitor center was a, a, a place that was designed to orient people to the province of British Columbia and allow people to explore. They had a theater there and all of that. So the hang glider, he was just there as one of the great outdoor things you can do in British Columbia. So that's what the hang glider is about. For the project. Just <laughs> I just like, tried to give you all this secret for now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the on the one hand, uh, what's next is to kind of try and deploy the techniques on something maybe at the scale of architecture or the what you understand is the the stuff of architecture, uh, materials or. Uh, orientations of stuff, you know, the, so you might understand facades, for instance. 
I, I think, though, on, on, on the other hand, the next step is really trying to kind of um, take more advantage of this kind of zooming in and getting a kind of finer degree of resolution of something that you're unfamiliar with. And maybe, I don't know, this sounds, um, this sounds wrong, but a kind of becoming familiar with it. But in other words, maybe a kind of figuring out how to build it in a sense, right? So trying to, so they're not going to remain images forever, let's, let's say, right? So trying to, um, but still keeping the, the kind of qualities and still keeping the kind of strangeness of resolution and strangeness of qualities, but uh, figuring out what it might mean, but figuring out how to build it and figuring out what it might mean at, at, uh, in terms of something that might be more recognizably architecture? I think we're just trying to work out some conceptual and technical things. And when we deploy it in the subject matter of, you know, landscapes and terrains, it's, uh, we could do it a little bit more on the cover and work things out, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi. Um, thank you for the conversation, it was great. Um, I think I want to go back to the conversation of enchantment that you were saying and this idea that right now, in a way, we've become disenchanted because of notions of digital like production or just an exhaustion of maybe formality in some sorts. Um, but I think what I think where, where your images are very successful are that, and that where the neural, the, the neural network at identifying them is very successful at is that for sure, in terms of composition, they are very innovative, but in terms of identifying type, or like in some sort of way references. So I, there's some images in which they're clear compositions, clear like ideas of what's specifically, a, like an idea of language and more generally. Instead of being technique, it identifies languages with, within the images and then reproduces it. Um, so I think I'm interested in this idea of like, for sure the, the I think the enchantment in this one and this images comes because of the high fidelity, so if we, in some sort of way, they're familiar enough to in which we become, we, 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 like, we can see them and we recognize them, um, which is something that doesn't happen when they are like foreigner and very digital, I would say. Um, but I, I think I wanna, this, uh, this notion of how familiarity and phenomenology and maybe understanding the genealogy of the image or how, what we recognize from it, is it important? In, in a very, I don't know, the, the way I would begin to answer that question is kind of in a very simple way. This idea of um, already, already feeling to some degree familiar with what you're looking at. Um, I mean, I would hope that you look a little closer and then it's very unfamiliar and a little bit perhaps disturbing in as much as uh, it would be that you thought you knew something and it's clearly not what you were expecting. Um, so this idea of kind of estrangement or this kind of uh, defamiliarization or just this anxiety that is produced, this the ideas of uh, the uncanny. Um, but I think it might be perhaps that's the moment where, perhaps that's the moment where enchantment kind of uh, re-emerges or is found or something and maybe that's the maybe to some degree that's another way of saying kind of why it's interesting to us or even why those that might be a way of saying why those were the images that were chosen even is because that's that's where you kind of have that uh, experience with the, the piece like if it if it has no meaning at the moment you you kind of have this expectation that it might or this this kind you get the a kind of sense of <coughs> enchantment well, um, maybe another way to say the same thing uh, for me is uh, we were talking about this earlier uh, today that in the end, uh, I think Carol and I, we care, uh, we don't really care about the subject matter. Uh, we deploy certain subject matter trying to produce the effect, knowing that it will produce a certain effect of, of uh, I don't know, like uh, the beholder will tend to orient themselves a certain way relative to certain kinds of images. But for us, we really don't care that much. We care about, much more about resolution 
Like uh, we uh, pushed ourselves and labored to just get a 30,000 by 30,000 pixel image. And how do we do this? You know, how do we scrape databases and manage that data? And how do we print it? And you know, how do we process it? It required a lot of technical innovation, actually, like uh, weird things that we had to invent as a way to do this. But the question is why, like it has more to do with why we, I think, are pretty hardcore formalists at the end of the day. And uh, we care much more about the actual stuff of the work rather than uh, anything to do with what it means or how we feel when we look at it. Yeah. But I think it's because it's only at that resolution and it's only when things start to have precision and these edges that you're talking about that uh, that's when the uh, that's when it becomes effective, yeah. right? Yeah, I guess uh, you just don't reconstruct aura when it's just a mushy, vague, uh, sloppy image that it just doesn't happen. It like, doesn't. But nothing I think gets reenchanted. Uh, but I think what you're uh, trying to say in a way is that it's yeah. the stuff. It's the stuff of the image that's what's interesting, right? Yeah. So, yeah, like it comes first. The stuff of the image comes. It drives everything else. I just have a question towards enchantment. I was wondering if once you, uh, once something becomes defamiliarized, right? Once you look at these images and they're strange or they're new or they're not familiar to you, is there a time before they fall into familiarity again and enchantment disappears? Or like, can something be unfamiliar for ever? Or does it become familiar? No, I mean, of course not, you know? Like, uh, like uh, and there I, I'm fully uh, uh, in agreement with Benjamin's analysis of this. Every time you copy it, and by looking at it a second time, that's like a form of copying. So like, even for us, I think, it, it has a way less aura than it does for you that hasn't been staring at it for so long now, you know? Like I'm seeing it in my sleep now and it's like, it's getting a little boring actually. But like every time it gets duplicated, every time it gets copied, I think it loses aura, you know? So I think uh, uh, it leads to maybe bizarre strategies, like how do you restrict, you know, the duplication of it? Like make it more difficult to absorb by the beholder, you know. So I think part of our sometimes our strategies of evasion of what it means is related to this to make it a little more durable, you know, in time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe maybe to wrap it up, the the, the last thing that I wanted to touch, and I, I think part of the power of many of the things that you guys have been talking, it has to do also the way that the work is displayed is fairly classical and conventional in the way that the gallery display. I was wonder if you pile all of it in a corner would be perceived in the way. So there is, there is something about the idea, which I think has been present along the years of many other work that I see from you guys. There is this kind of relentless negotiation between certain very out there innovation, but at the same time, always get big to be repacked with certain forms of classical knowledge, like uh, symmetry, or in this case, the, the pieces are in the middle, and the, the images, of course, are in the wall, and in the hand, uh, they're hung on the view, view high, like a... Quarter so, inch reveal between model and photo. Exactly, so everything, <laughs> everything is incredibly conventional in terms of the display. Uh, but I, I, I will project it further into many other other experiments you guys have with design, like revisiting symmetry and so on. Um, how much you think that tension remains critical, uh, not critical, crucial f to the message you want to convey, or at some moment mm. you should let it fly? No, I think it's critical. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we I, might I think it's wrong. part of the familiar, 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 familiarity and defamiliarity. But I also think, I don't know, the interest is in the, the stuff. It's not in the exhibition. It's not in, 
right? So you have to have a kind of, you kind of have to, I don't think the relationship between the viewer and the object is something that needs to be challenged because I think it's, uh, it's the stuff itself that is uh, perhaps being challenged, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not about um, making the work artifacts that, you're, so you're challenging a relationship between someone and the artifact. And it's not about challenging an exhibition either. Anyway, so I, I, I don't think it's gonna fly. We're not gonna let it fly. <laughs> well, I think uh, also like it's related to your interest in the uncanny, my interest in estrangement, which might actually be the exact same interest, but with different genealogies, you know, that uh, I think uh, when you remove all convention, you end up uh, and go for an absolutely weird, you actually get one of the most familiar things we can think of. You know, that's why I think monsters are not scary, but hilarious. And, you know, because when we try to do something absolutely different, we have to resort to an image of difference that we already know. You know, so I think uh, the only way to truly produce something a little weird is by unmaking something that we know partially. You know, so I think having some degree of convention, and so you're, that's absolutely right. I'm, I'm glad you noticed, you know, because I think uh, uh, the layout of the exhibition was very much intended to go straight into the other conventions of how exhibitions are hung. Like uh, we very deliberately uh, incorporated the very typical uh, center line for pictures uh, that you use in museums, you know, and so on. And, uh, so I think the tension uh, definitely interests us, you know, and how straightforward it's laid out, but how weird the work is, and yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to thank you guys for the talk. I want to thank you for the exhibition. It's a terrific one, and. Uh, I hope everybody already saw it, and if you haven't, go on and check it out again. It's worth seeing it again. So thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you.